Now can you hear me? Helps if you turn it on. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, my name is John Abrams, and I'm the lead platform engineer at Ouya. And I'm here to talk to you a bit about um, front-end rendering, back-end rendering, pros and cons of each, and how to get the best out of both of them. Um, so I'm just going to cover a bit of the, the basics to begin with. Uh, so first of all, server-side rendering, also known as um, back-end rendering. Uh, this is how most web pages and web apps have been rendered uh, until recently, where you use tools like Rails or PHP or Django and Python, where uh, the server, let's take a look at a nice little graph here, where the user types in a URL into the browser, it sends an HTTP request to the server, the server figures out uh, perhaps who is visiting via a cookie or something like that, um, and if it doesn't know, it, what it does is it takes a bunch of data and it takes a bunch of HTML, combines them together into a final bit of HTML that it then responds with. And then the browser basically just renders the HTML and there might be some extra CSS and there might be some extra JavaScript to go along with it to make it look nice and have some nice effects. Uh, the user then does something there, clicks a link, fills out a form, uh, which then causes the browser to send another request back to the server, where it then goes through the same process again, where it combines data and HTML, puts them together, sends it back to the browser, and the browser refreshes an entire web page over again. Uh, and then we have client-side rendering. Sorry, it just took a second to load there, because that's what happens with client-side rendering. Uh, where there's a lot of good, awesome new tools like uh, AngularJS, React, Ember, Backbone. Um, where what happens now is that the uh, user or the browser, uh, browser you, the, the user puts in a URL into the browser. The browser makes a request to the server just like before. But what happens differently now is that it returns a layout HTML. There's no data necessarily in that HTML. It basically defines where the data will go eventually, sends that back to the browser, and the browser uh, reads the HTML, um, renders it, perhaps it renders a nice little loading icon, uh, and then it runs the JavaScript that came along with it, and then that JavaScript makes a follow-up API call automatically, which then goes either to the same server or a different server, which then responds with JSON data that gets sent back to the browser, and then the JavaScript code, um, powered by a framework, uh, will then finally render it on the client side. So it's the browser that's taking the data and taking the HTML, putting them together, and then finally showing it to the user. Um, but the cool thing with this, though, so, this, so far this seems like a huge downside. Why would anybody do this? But uh, a big benefit to this is that whenever the user interacts now, it's just data that's going over the pipe. Uh, it's just API calls that occur at that point. And um, the entire web page is not refreshed. Uh, that's why they're called single page applications, because it's just a single page that then just re-renders the data uh, on the browser. So a quick overview of the benefits between both. So server side, um, it's all in one round trip. So you don't have that extra time that you're waiting for the API call to come back. Um, another benefit of server side is that it doesn't require JavaScript on the client. Uh, and you have great frameworks like Rails and Django. And then on the, with client side uh, rendering or front end rendering, um, we have uh, an API that is required for the, for, for the web, uh, which can also then be reused for mobile, which is really cool. So you can develop a web app and an API all at the same time, which is really fantastic. You can be a consumer of your API that you then maybe even share it to third parties. Um, the other benefit I mentioned before, which is there's no refreshing once the user interacts. And you also have great frameworks like Angular and Ember and React and all these cool new, new toys that are really fun to play with. So, the question is, can we use these cool, new, fun front-end frameworks, but remove that initial delay, that initial round trip? Um, so I'm going to propose or talk about uh, this concept that I'm calling API prefetching. I'm, I'm sure many people have done this before, but I never saw a good name for it. So I'm calling it API prefetching. Now, the idea with this is to turn the client-side rendering, which is what I'm showing here. I showed you this previously, but turn it from this into this where when the browser sends its initial request to the server, 
uh, the server returns both the layout HTML and the JSON data in the same response, and then it can then be rendered right in the first go. But from then on, uh, it's just JSON data going across the pipe. So how would this work code-wise? Well, uh, this would be kind of like what a rendered response from the server uh, would be. So it's a typical, this is a, a snippet from the index.html, it's not the full one, you know. Um, but it would have, you know, your, your standard library at the top, like jQuery or Angular or whatever. Um, but then there's this extra script tag where we add a global variable called API prefetch data. And in there it can define uh, the JSON responses of uh, API calls that you're gonna make. So the server knows that um, your Angular app is going to make a call to slash API slash user to get the username of the currently logged in user, or it's gonna make a call to posts in, the, posts in order to list all the posts. So if it knows it's gonna make that request uh, in the future, it pre-fetches it for you and renders it right into uh, the script tag there. And then so uh, when you eventually do the API call, you don't need to make the API call. You can check here first to see if the data is available. If it's available, use it, and then wipe it away so that if you then were to make another call to it, it would hit the server. Um, and if you're making a call that's not listed in your API prefetch data, then um, what you would do is go to the internet and hit your server. Uh, so to implement that, it is a bit hairy code-wise. Oh, before we get to that, let me just explain that it, it actually makes things load faster. So here's like a, a best case scenario where I was just testing this um, on broadband to a server in San Francisco and I was at home in San Mateo. And this is without the data prefetching. It was about 607 milliseconds. And with the prefetching, it was about 20% faster. It actually varies quite a bit. Uh, and I recommend uh, if you are thinking about implementing this to try it out various applications and scenarios of clients and uh, where your servers are located and where your clients are located and how they're connected, whether it's mobile or, or um, broadband, it, it can have an effect. But generally, it's faster. It just makes sense that it would be. Um, so to make it easier to implement this on the front end so that you don't have to worry about checking that global variable, see if it has data there, and then wiping it out so that you don't hit it twice in the same session, uh, I created a handy little library for you guys to use on the front end called API Prefetch. And basically, it takes what you had before, but notice here I added an extra line at the top where you include that library. And this way, now when you make a request, it will automatically check it for you uh, and or hit the internet depending on what's needed. So the way it does that is it monkey, monkey patches uh, XML HTTP request. Um, and the nice, way, nice thing about doing it this way is that it just works for whatever library you're using, whether it's jQuery, Angular, Ember, React. Uh, you don't have to customize the behavior of, of getting this activity done. Um, but in order to do this, there's uh, a, a few things you need to do on the back end to make sure you do it right. Um, so I'm just going to go over a, a few things to look out for. So the first one is to you want to avoid cross-site scripting attacks. Um, so the way to do this is you want to escape. So before I tell you how to do it. So here's an example of that, where if a user types, say, a, a tweet or a, a post on your site uh, and includes a closing script tag, then they can make an opening script tag and put in any JavaScript they, they want, which will then run on other users' browsers, which would be bad. So the way to stop them from doing that is you just escape the, uh, the forward slash uh, on the script tag. So it, it renders exactly the same, but the browser doesn't see it as a closing script tag. And so a quick bit of JavaScript to do that is here. Um, that'll be available on the slides uh, that you can download afterwards. Um, next thing to, uh, to do to make sure you do it right is you have to make sure that your view URLs map to your API URLs. That way, the server can make a correct guess as to which API calls your front end application is likely to make automatically once it loads. Um, so for example, if you're making a Twitter clone, uh, if you have your slash tweets uh, URL, um, then perhaps your API call should be slash API slash tweets. And then that way your server knows um, how to preload it. Uh, otherwise, you can put in exceptional, you know, um, you can code in little 
changes or exceptions if you want on the uh, back end. But that helps make your code uh, a lot simpler. Um, another thing is your front end app needs to run in HTML, HTML5 mode. What that means is don't use the hash symbol uh, in your URL like a lot of uh, front end uh, frameworks will do automatically. Most of them have uh, an option to enable HTML5 mode whereby it can use uh, the push state functionality in browsers so that it can change the URL um, while the user is interacting with the website. The advantage to this is uh, now the entire path is sent to the browser. Uh, the way browsers work is they don't send the information after the hash symbol uh, to the browser because that's meant for the browser. But the server needs to know which view is going to be loaded. That way it knows which API uh, responses to prefetch for the call. Uh, another thing is that your, um, it'd be helpful if your API request handlers can also be invoked by the server itself. That way, um, the code that renders the view can also invoke the API call. So if you have your API handled by a separate machine, then it's relatively simple in that your, um, the, the server that handles the view request can just hit the API. Um, but if it's the, the same app, then just make sure you construct your application in a way where it can be, it can be called by the view. Uh, another key thing is that uh, if you want to prefetch data that is protected by authentication, you should use cookies for authentication. That way, when the initial request comes from the browser to the server, the server knows who the user is. If you're using another form of authentication like tokens, they may not be sent automatically by the browser uh, to the server. So cookies aren't necessarily dead yet. Um, so uh, here's a quick list of libraries that help you to do this uh, easily. So I mentioned API prefetch.js. Um, but I also wrote a backend framework for Node.js that has this as a feature. So simple plug there. Um, but I haven't come across any um, libraries uh, to help do this with Rails, Java, Python, PHP. Uh, perhaps I haven't, I'm just not looking hard enough. Uh, uh, I have a feeling that a lot of companies might do something similar to this um, themselves, but haven't necessarily released libraries for this. So if you, if you know of anyone that does this or has libraries, please get in touch. I'd love to share that. Um, some of you might be thinking now, why do you need to do this prefetching of API calls if you don't necessarily do that for images and JavaScript code and CSS, which are known as static assets? Well, the difference here is that the assets uh, often are already cached by the browser. Um, sometimes even there's an asset shared between multiple websites and can already be cached by the browser. For example, if you're loading up uh, jQuery uh, from the Google CDN, it's likely that a user has already visited another website that's loaded jQuery over the CDN. And speaking of CDNs, assets are also uh, servable from a CDN, meaning they can be served from a server that's much closer to the user. Meanwhile, the API is usually kept close to home base wherever um, that might be. Uh, so usually the API calls have to travel a longer distance than the calls to get um, assets. Uh, also, browsers can often prefetch themselves uh, static assets. So they can see that you're about to click a link or you're on a page that links to uh, a site and it can actually go and visit it and see that there's a bunch of assets that are going to be needed and it'll start downloading it right away. Also, when you first load a, a web page in a browser, it will look to see what assets are being referenced uh, in, that, in the HTML and will start, start downloading them in parallel together so that even by the time the HTML is finished downloading, it'll be close to be finished downloading all the static assets. But the API calls, they won't even be executed until the JavaScript is downloaded and the JavaScript is parsed and then it's executed, then the API call starts. So it'd be nice if we can skip that step at the end with the API prefetching. Um, also, HTTP, HTTP 2.0 um, is, is going to be a thing uh, where you make a request to the server and then it can respond with the HTML, but it can also respond with a bunch of static assets that it knows the browser is going to need. Um, and this prefetching of the API can even fit right in with that. And that way, the initial response has everything needed by uh, the browser to render the, the final view to the user. So that's it for the talk. Uh, apparently, I talk super fast. Um, but uh, we've got time for questions now. And so here are some links of stuff that I mentioned in the talk. And uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>
So, any questions? How does server-side templating fit in with that? So it doesn't. So this, this is a, actually a way to move away from server-side templating and to, this allows you to rely on the front-end templating as it is. So like you can rely on uh, vanilla AngularJS like out of the box, um, but you're using a portion of the server-side rendering to basically make the API call and then stick it into that um, top global API prefetch data there. So you're using basically just a sliver of server-side rendering to put in that JSON data at the top. Um, but the rest of the, the web page is handled completely by a front-end framework. Uh, I guess that's it. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>